welcome back and uh, the breakaway session for today that i am moderating i meaning sara berry am moderating is approaching power authorities a very interesting session because at some point um in our journeys we have to approach our authorities and that could be uh the media or uh, the government or whatever else and uh, we have with us today Amy Jones and Paul Healy who are the co-founders of Moving Animals and uh, I will start with a brief introduction about them after which they will present and then we have Ismail Agung who's the com campaign manager for International Animal Rescue I will be welcoming Ismail later on but we start with a brief introduction um, for Amy and Paul So Moving Animals is a media project by Amy Jones and Paul Healy. Their mission is to connect the world to animal stories through powerful photography, footage and journalism. Since 2018 they have worked on the ground across seven different countries to document the plight of animals. Their work has informed and strengthened the campaigns of multiple animal advocacy groups. and featured in over 150 media outlets from popular content platforms like Umilad and Vice to industry leading publications including the Guardian and Channel News Asia over to you Amy and Paul Hello everyone my name is Paul Healy and this is Amy Jones and together we're the co-founders of Moving Animals It's really great to be here and thanks so much to Asia for Animals for hosting this conference where we can all come together to help create change for animals. Today we're delighted to talk to you about taking animal stories to mainstream media where in this talk we're going to draw upon examples of our own work with moving animals and discuss how powerful visuals, research and storytelling can encourage fresh attention and media coverage for your work for animals. So Moving Animals is essentially a photojournalism and media project. We combine photography and footage with journalism techniques to craft stories that will help catch the world's attention with animal issues. So we work on the ground to document the animals used for food, entertainment, fashion and experimentation. So this is from slaughterhouses to circuses, for example. And since 2018 we documented at over 75 locations across seven different countries getting animal stories in front of those who need to see them is at the heart of everything we do and so of course the media plays a big role in our work and our stories have been featured in over 150 media outlets around the world such as news sites like Channel News Asia, The Guardian and viral content platforms such as Unilad and The Power of Positivity as well as working to tell animal stories in the media we supply powerful photography and footage to NGOs which is then used to strengthen their campaigns as well as encourage media attention to the issues that they are fighting so the power of the media the media is a great way to advocate for animals because of its ability to reach millions of people all around the world effective storytelling can also help people to connect with animals and importantly animals who they may have never really considered before so as well as educating audiences media attention can drive support for your cause add pressure for change and encourage people to take action so the best stories are the emotive ones they make us laugh sad inspired or energized to make a change So for us in the planning stages we try and think of ways to tell these stories in creative ways which will engage people what does the media want to post about and how can we fill that space with stories that relate to animal issues many platforms also have their own style and so we try to tailor a specific story to a specific platform and then pitch it directly to the editor so today we're going to discuss some case studies of our own work to explain what we thought worked well and help us to get these stories placed in the media So first we're going to talk about how we told Dumbo's story. We came across a baby elephant while we were documenting the animals confined to a zoo in Thailand. 
This baby elephant was forced to rave to music, play musical instruments and perform tricks, all for tourist entertainment. And this happened up to three times a day, all under the threat of a sharp ball hook. It was quite clear from his skeletal body that he was suffering from possible malnutrition and exhaustion. I really vividly remember watching tourists laugh and take selfies with the elephants while Dumbo stood there just with his eyes closed, sucking on his trunk, which is a sign of distress, and they do that so that they can comfort themselves when they're not with their mother. So to engage with the media storm, which was created by the Disney film being released that same week, we nicknamed this baby elephant Dumbo, and we pitched his story to a journalist who we knew was sympathetic to elephants. Dumbo's story went viral, and was published by multiple major media outlets, television channels, and viral video platforms around the world. We felt really hopeful. Over 200,000 people actually signed the petition demanding that the zoo release him to a sanctuary, which resulted in the government stepping in to order a health checkup for Dumbo, where it was actually revealed that he was suffering from a serious digestive tract infection. But then in a, a really awful, tragic turn of events, Dumbo passed away from his illness before he could be rescued. This campaign showed us how a single animal story can help to spread awareness of a much wider issue whilst also offering hope. There was so much momentum that Dumbo's freedom was a possibility. The outcome was tragically different, but we really hope that his story will continue to influence and engage the public and lawmakers to help fight against captivity and animal performances. Just as a slight end note to that as well, the zoo has now actually been closed and the two elephants who were also used in performance was, performances with Dumbo are now experiencing freedom for the first time. So when we unpack Dumbo's story, we can really see what techniques we use to tell the story effectively. So for one, we really honed in on the emotional details. So when you're trying to work out the emotional angle of your story, think about what it is that affects you personally, because that is often what will engage someone else too. For example, in our pitch, we really drew attention to Dumbo's malnourished state and how he sucked on his trunk for comfort, because those were really the things that moved us when we were documenting at the zoo. Another key point of this story was the focus on the individual, as it helps create a deeper connection, one where the audience can feel like they really know the animal, which makes it easier to inspire empathy. One of the ways we helped people to connect to this individual is by giving him a nickname. So the name in this case helps people to see this elephant as an individual with their own life story. And of course, there's also the current hook of the Dumbo film, um, which we use to engage with the media storm of the huge blockbuster Disney film of the same name, which was released at the same time. So this helped tie in this animal's story with something that people were already talking about at the time. And another crucial part of this story was the photos and footage. Firstly, of course, they showed proof of what was happening, but also in an age of digital media where people are scrolling so fast, they really helped to capture attention and make people pause. And because the footage and photographs were also so heartbreaking to look at, they caused this outrage and shock, which really drove people to take action. And photography is such an incredibly powerful way to tell stories, which is why a huge part of our work at Moving Animals focuses on animal photojournalism. So globally, there are countless animals confined for our entertainment or slaughtered for consumption. And when confronted with such huge numbers, it can be really hard to picture the individuals behind the stats. And we really believe that Photographs can help to bridge that gap and allow others to witness this injustice and the violence that is often so carefully hidden from us. And crucially, when combining this really powerful and persuasive medium of photography with the reach of mainstream media, you then have this really effective tool to help change people's perceptions of animals. So for our second case study, we conducted an undercover investigation at an open air slaughterhouse in Cambodia, where an estimated 600 pigs are killed every night. The walls of the slaughterhouse are formed by apartment buildings, and so for many of the families living there and their young children, their only window directly overlooks the killing floor. 
we published this investigation with the Guardian as part of the Animals Farm series. So obviously this story is very different from Dumbo's story. And I think that's important because it reminds us that there are so many ways to tell animal stories. The aspects we had focused on in Dumbo's story are not really relevant to how we told this slaughterhouse story. And so that brings us to the fact that different platforms cover different stories in different ways. The Guardian, for example, is one of the UK's leading news platforms and it's known for its serious tone and well-researched stories. I think what really caught the Guardian's attention with this story was how we framed our pitch to focus not just on the animal slaughter itself, but also the emotional violence inflicted on the slaughterhouse workers, as well as the families who practically live inside the slaughterhouse's walls. Our footage showed one worker repeatedly look away as his colleague slit the animal's throats. And I think this really highlighted that human impact element of the story. I think we found that this sort of footage can be really difficult to get placed because it is so graphic. I know that The Guardian receives a lot of undercover footage, but by exploring a unique angle, a story within a story, we were able to get the story placed in a mainstream publication and really draw attention to how the animal agriculture industry affects both animals and humans too. So in summary so far, these are some of the key things that we have found to be successful in crafting and telling an effective story that the mainstream media will be interested in publishing. So now we're going to take a look at how to pitch your story to the media. There are a lot of great guides on how to write a successful pitch online already, and we can link you to a few good articles that we'll show at the end. So for this section, we're just going to focus on how to really maximise your pitch when you send it to a publication. So first of all, if the story hasn't been published before, offer it as an exclusive, as outlets really like to get first pick on something. And key thing here though is if you offer something as an exclusive, make sure that you keep it exclusive, otherwise you will burn bridges with journalists, which is just the last thing you want to do. Um, you should also try and find animal sympathetic journalists and editors. So you can do this by reading their previous stories and keeping tabs on the journalists who are writing these animal stories. So you should also make sure that you email journalists or edit editors directly with your pitch. If it goes straight to their inbox, they're much more likely to read it. You should also work on building relationships with journalists and media outlets. So we'd recommend using Twitter to follow and show support for their work. And also, if you feel like you have got stories to offer now or in the future, you can consider reaching out to ask if they'd be interested in meeting for a coffee or jumping on a quick call. So also try and tailor each pitch to each platform, as many of the platforms have their own style. So I think we touched on it previously, but that's how we collaborated with The Guardian on the Pig's Law to House story. And it was because we felt that it would really support their focus on global farming and this growth of Asia's meat industry. And another thing that we find really, really important is to just regularly read multiple news outlets to just always have a feel for the kind of stories that they like to cover. So another tip to maximise your potential at getting your story place is to think about what it is exactly that you can offer to the media. It may be that you're offering original photos or footage, which, as we mentioned, can really help get your story placed. But it doesn't always have to be visual content. Original research can back up your story or even become the story itself. So, for example, when the news that the coronavirus had mutated on Danish mink fur farms, we researched which stores in the UK were still selling mink fur products. Afterwards, we crafted this research into an original piece and it was published in a national UK paper as well as a leading fashion publication. And sometimes it can be as simple as helping to journalists connect the dots. If you've seen a story in your local news or even on social media about an issue that you think could benefit from the national press, you can send it as a tip to a newsroom 
for example, we read a statement in a Cambodian newspaper about how the elephants at the Angkor Wat tourist attraction were being retired after being used for many years in elephant riding industry. But when we searched for the story online in the international press, it hadn't actually been covered yet. But we thought it was a great news to hear and a great story that could help remind tourists not to ride elephants. So we sent the article, along with some brief facts and figures about elephant riding, to some of the newspapers in the UK. And within a few days, the story had been covered in multiple mainstream publications. And the final tip of this section is to remember to collaborate with others in the animal advocacy movement if it could help strengthen your story. That could mean connecting with photojournalists, investigators or research groups. So thank you so much for joining us today. We really hope that you found it useful. I think we're going to take some questions and have a discussion now. But if you do have anything that you'd like to talk about separately or after the chat is finished, don't hesitate to reach out at amy at movinganimals.org. And just as a side note, the Moving Animals Project is in itself a resource for the animal advocacy movement. And you can learn more about that at movinganimals.org. And one of the things that we're quite excited to release next month will be our free to use archive of photos. And that will also be found on our website. Thank you so much for everything that you do for animals. I think it was uh, so full of uh, valuable tips that uh, will come handy for the audience that is tuned in right now. And we'll come back to the questions. I'm sure there'll be plenty. Uh, after this presentation by Ismail Agong, who's the campaign manager for International Animal Rescue. Um, Ismail joined uh, IAR Indonesia in 2015 and currently holds the position of campaign manager. He works to promote conservation awareness on social media and the digital world. Agung developed and manages Kukango, a campaign platform used as an information vessel for slow lorries conservation in Indonesia. He also developed a Gibbon Nisha, a similar platform dedicated to Indonesian Gibbon conservation. I hope Agung have got all those pronunciations by and largely correct. Over to you. Hello, everyone. My name is Ismail Agung. I'm a part of IR Indonesia. Thank you for the opportunity to present our work here at AFA 2021. I would like to present to you the issue of the YouTube monkey problems with an insight from Indonesia. Okay, this is the overview of the current situation regarding monkeys in Indonesia. So in Indonesia, we have two monkeys that are not protected by government. That is a long tail uh, and big tail macaques. Because of that, uh, people think that both of these primates are legal to buy or to keep them as a pets. In 2020, we received a lot of reports from our supporters. Uh, they sending sending us a link videos from YouTube and telling us that video are so uh, monkey abused or poor welfare uh, condition. And, and then based on the digital data, 70% uh, of population in, in Indonesia are internet user and 90% of them are actively accessing YouTube. So YouTube is the number one social media platform in Indonesia. On that situation, we try to collect the uh, data from YouTube. We started to scraping monkey uh, monkey videos using the keyword monyet dan and baby, baby monyet mean monkey and baby monkey, and after that we check all videos and categorize it by its content. Uh, it is pet monkey, uh, uh, wildlife documentary, or education and awareness, and etc. We also recorded how old are the monkey in the videos, uh, like a baby, juvenile, or adult. So here, uh, what we found, uh, as you can see, the number of monkey are, uh, monkey videos are increased every year. And here's the problem, the red bar, that is the pet monkeys videos. If we comparing it from the last two years, the number of uh, these pet monkeys videos are drastically increased in 2020. So we try to break it down closely to see what's happening to this pet monkey videos by month. And here's, uh, the graphic, the pet monkey videos, yeah, as you can see in the graphic, the pet monkeys video are not common in 20, 
uh, uh, until tw uh, December 29. And in the end of 2019, it start to increase, but uh, it decreased on January, February 2020 because of the pandemic situation uh, had begun in, in Indonesia during that time. However, uh, three months after that, it started to rise again. And as you can see, the top upload, uh, uploaded videos show on November. And then how old are the monkeys that you use in the videos? More than 90% are baby monkey. Uh, we have to agree that uh, baby monkey are cute. Uh, for the video creators, uh, baby, baby monkey are easy to handle. They love to share uh, in the video how to take care of the baby, like feeding, bathing, playing, sleeping, or show the unboxing baby monkey uh, from the tiny card book just after they bought it from the trader. So why uh, pet monkeys booming in 2020? Here is our assumption that could be the reason why this phenomenon happened. The first one, people get bored and stay at home because of the lockdown. Uh, and then they record and uploading their pet monkey began to be a new hobby. And then in March 2020, there were influencers in Indonesia who call themselves uh, animal lovers. Uh, they shared uh, their new pet monkeys in social media. If we cross check with the monthly graphic, uh, the number of videos are rising up after this happening. And the last reason is uh, getting money from YouTube. Yes, as a creator, YouTube gives us uh, money from the ads that shown in the videos. So how to get money from YouTube? Yes. Before you are able to monetize it, the, uh, the channel should have fulfilled the requirement. That is uh, a thousand subscriber and 4,000 4, watch time hours. From the data we collected, there are 29% of pet monkey channels are monetized or eligible to be monetized. Even the videos, uh, the video keywords are small, they uploaded a lot of videos because they want to reach 4,000 watch hour. So what's wrong with the pet monkey videos? From the content creator perspective, they could think that they are being good because they are providing food and place for the, uh, the monkey. But that is a natural uh, behavior and, treat and treatment, such as uh, dressing the monkey or lock uh, in the tiny cage and chaining up, uh, chain up. And most of the videos, we see the baby uh, monkeys are without their mom. And the saddest thing I saw in here, I read the comments and some of them are happy to watch when the monkey are suffering, like prank with the chili sauce or give the energy drink or uh, trying to walk with two arms tied up and fighting with the cats. So, and then there is uh, two cases in Indonesia that become viral and were uh, taking down of the monkey abuse this year. Our campaign platform, Cook and Cook, blow up this uh, Alipro channel in Twitter. It went viral and more than 10,000 Indonesian netizens reported his channel. Uh, 18 hours after that, his channel was removed by YouTube. But a week later, he created a new one uh, with the same videos. The forestry uh, department has a uh, track and warned him, but his new channel still exists until now. And the other, uh, the other case is like Rian Abang Satwa. Uh, he was reported to Jakarta government. Uh, forestry department came down to his house and uh, confiscated all his monkey. He deleted all his monkey videos by his own and now he got 15 days in prison. Actually, we want all monkey video abuse are taken down like this, but there are too many. Okay, so what's the consequences? Yes, uh, the increase of pet monkey video also pushed the monkey trade in Indonesia. People are encouraged to follow their idol or looking for the same opportunity in YouTube. As you can see in the graphic, the volume of the monkey trade increased every month, and more than 3,000 monkeys are sold illegally on Facebook during 2020. And the other, part, uh, the, the other consequences is not only in YouTube, other social media platforms have the same issues. Uh, this is an example of pet monkey in Instagram and TikTok. Uh, this influencer has received a lot of complaints about her monkey but she continued to displace, uh, display it because it increased her engagement in social media. So more comment, more traffic engagement, more popular she is, and more money she got. Uh, and this is the other, uh, the last one. When people have some hobby, uh, they think why not to build a communities. This, one of communi uh, this is one of communities that call themselves a, a monkey lover. They claim they are saving the monkey by keeping them as a pet. 
So if, uh, if an independent situation, they, uh, they love to hold event or gathering. A community planned to have a monkey fishing show uh, on February 2021, but uh, after it went viral, they canceled it a day before the event. And in their Facebook group, they not only share uh, pictures of their pet monkey, they promoted and asked the member to subscribe their YouTube channel. Uh, this is the challenge to, uh, that we have to face. If you want to report animal abuse videos in YouTube, you cannot do it in your mobile phone. Animal abuse reports only show uh, on your browser uh, a sub, uh, subsection, uh, violent and recursive content. Many people now are accessing, uh, accessing YouTube with their mobile phone. So I think YouTube must consider this report section in their mobile app. After this, maybe you can try and check it on your mobile, on your mobile phone. And in Indonesia, uh, monkey news remain negative in sentiment. Uh, if we read news about the conflict in, in farming area, monkey always to blame and consider as pets. Uh, and there, this is the serious problem, uh, monkey head get movement. Uh, so what is this uh, monkey head get? So this is a community of uh, monkey heart, uh, monkey haters online uh, with a psychological implication. They make a video playlist that show uh, monkey suffering or torture. The reason behind this phenomenon is unknown, but there are uh, different theories. Okay, so mitigating Indonesian monkey YouTube problem. Yes, we want to change people behavior. So to raise awareness, uh, we need more positive video content such as uh, videos of monkey in the wild. And this year, uh, the IUCN released uh, best practice guidelines for uh, responsible image of non-human primates. Uh, I think these guidelines should be adopted and applied, uh, uh, applied by every organization and even the public. And as I mentioned before, long-tailed and big-tailed uh, macaques are not uh, non-protected primates in Indonesia. The IUCN, re uh, IUCN recently upgraded their conservation status categorization, and now both are considered a vulnerable species. We want to encourage the government to elevate the protected status of these monkeys. In Indonesia, uh, we do have law, uh, laws concern, uh, concerning animal welfare, but unfortunately, these laws are rarely used to take action against a case of animal cruelty. We hope the authorities will look up to this animal welfare, welfare more, especially in case involving non-protected species such as uh, macaques. We see that there has been a couple of small success in Indonesia take down to individual content creators. However, this problem is so large and widespread. This approach will not work. We need to come together to lobby YouTube maybe into changing their regulation, like stop monetizing and remove problem uh, monkey videos. We recently joined the Social Media Animal Cruelty Coalition that has dedicated to finding a solution to this specific issue. If anybody wants to help, please save the SMACC website and where there is guidance, how to report such videos and how you can support uh, these reports. That's it. Hope we can discuss a lot in the next session. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Agong, for that presentation. And uh, we have a couple of questions that uh, we would love to pose. Um, the first is that uh, there's an overload of supply of news items to the media which results in fatigue. And in such a situation, it is extremely difficult to make one's cause heard. What do you feel would work well in securing that one minute of attention? Amy, would you like to address that to begin with? And then we could perhaps check is uh, with Agung also. No, that's such a good point. There are so many stories going on you know, all the time. Um, I think what we found really important that we touch upon in our presentation is just to really tailor your story to a specific outlet. And when pitching the story itself, like make sure you use like a really short, informative, clever subject line that's just going to appear in the inbox and going to really grab that editor's attention. And one thing that we found also helps when we try and get our story placed is to think about the timing. So whether you're linking your story to something that's already happening in the news, that's going to get journalists' attention because it's you know, related to current affairs. Or perhaps you can plan ahead and if you know a calendar events coming up, 
that you mm. think you have a story that could link to that that's also a really good hook and a good link mm. and if you you're doing it like specifically on a campaign you should think about campaign milestone for example say half a million people speak out against a certain issue use that as a media hook as well because that's just a really good way to get your, your story out there and mm. yeah i think like the most important thing as well is just really make sure you mention in your pitch why the readers need to hear this story so mm. why why is this story important and why does it need to be told because that will help convince editors convince journalists convince media outlets to publish the story absolutely uh, that's a very valid point uh, thank you so much amy for that agunga a question for you um you mentioned about this uh, entire uh, not episode, but this, you know, this cruelty to its uh, monkeys, which is happening on YouTube, which was also on a large scale. Um, this is a huge challenge. And how do you think uh, one could mitigate this challenge? How do you think one can use social media in today's time and age to uh, you know, kind of uh, address this challenge in a more... Uh, effective manner. What are your thoughts on social media per se? And how can, say, a layman, for example, uh, begin a movement of sorts, in other words? Thank you. Uh, before that, I'm, I'm really sorry if there's a noise in here uh, because of the situation and my test. OK. Uh, but yeah, this is a really huge challenge. But I think, yes, the first thing we have to do is like to approach the platform. That's because. Uh, they have the regulation, they have the uh, access for that. We only can see from the other, uh, far away from the other side. So better if like we have like more, uh, like uh, work together with the platform, like as YouTube is like uh, them like that. So it's better if we give them like uh, what kind of the uh, proper video for the animals is like that and then uh, if we can collaborate too we can be like there's a problem with the animals at this video we can report for two time and then they will take it down or yeah it's easy youtube be, uh, being popular because they give mm -hmm. us the monetizing so if we mm -hmm. want uh, to take them is like, do not give them a place for get money from uh, the videos mm -hmm. I, I, is it, uh, yeah, actually like in, for the videos abuse, monkey abuse. I think that uh, how to approach the form is better. Mm -hmm. uh, can can we report one by one? I think that's really difficult if we want to report one by one because I, we don't know how many reports we they need taking down. It's mm -hmm. better we have like collaborate with the platform. Okay. Okay. Related. Yeah. And uh, this collaboration that you are talking about, how easy or how difficult is it to go about? Is it easy to approach a platform in a as a collaborative effort? It's not really easy, of course, yes. Uh, but I think uh, now we're not only one because this, this uh, situation is like a global, not only in Indonesia. There's, this happened in the other uh, country, like um, Cambodia, they, they do have the same problem like this uh, videos. And then mm -hmm. uh, another Asia Thailand, I think we, yeah, we have to collaborate together and then we, uh, we tell them this is the situation. And I, I, I see the, this, uh, another platform like Facebook, they are already like taking down all the group for trading. So why not uh, like YouTube, they doing the same thing like uh, Facebook, they have commitment right now and, or maybe TikTok, TikTok maybe not really uh, start there, but they uh, have a commitment uh, and they, mm -hmm like a uh, coalition with uh, uh, another uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, organization for the animals. Mm -hmm. So I think mm -hmm. that the first thing they have, like um, maybe a like, um, commitment for the animal abuse uh, videos in the YouTube platform. Okay. Thank you so much, Agum, for that input. Uh, Amy and Paul, coming back to both of you, uh, photojournalism is indeed a very powerful tool. There are no, there's no doubt about it. Um, but if not photojournalism, then what could one use as a tool to generate maximum impact with the least uh, span of time made available, according to you? I think um, one way we've found really effective has been to actually produce our own research. So we spoke about it briefly in the presentation where 
we investigated what shops were selling um, fur products. And so we put that together um, as an interest piece and it actually got picked up by the national news. So that's a really good uh, way to uh, work on animal issues and conduct original research that you're offering to a platform and you can do that from your own home. We've been doing it over lockdown where we haven't been able to get out and do photojournalism. So it's been really a really good way to do that. Um, mm -hmm. Original research, mm -hmm. I think about issues that maybe are overlooked. So another story that we had some success with was an unusual issue of uh, frog consumption and how many frogs are killed each year for uh, frog delicacies around the world. So that was an issue that we thought was often overlooked. So researching that issue and providing that to a journalist was effective mm -hmm. because, precisely because it was an unusual issue. So think outside the box when it comes to your original research because there might be issues that are interesting because they haven't been covered before. Mm. I think that's a, that's a very interesting point, Paul. And um, during this journey of yours, I mean, photojournalism brings also with it a number of challenges. So uh, what would you say was uh, the biggest challenge that you faced as photojournalists and how did you overcome those? Yeah, I think that is definitely something we're still working to overcome, sort of all the challenges that come with it. Obviously, you've got mm. all the physical challenges like access and all the things that go along with that. But another one of the main things is burnout as well. I think all of us in the animal advocacy movement can relate to this, that when we're focusing on such sort of emotional topics and things that are really close to our heart all the time and something we really care about, um, it's very easy to burn out. I know that we mm -hmm. have now learned a lesson that we need to find things that work for us to look after us, whether it's meditation or going for a walk or mm -hmm. just reminding ourselves that there is good in the world. Because when mm -hmm. you're looking at so many painful photos or seeing so many mm -hmm. painful situations or working on so many painful issues, mm -hmm. yeah not burning out is really important and leaning on others in the animal advocacy movement as well you know we're all mm. and that one has to actually devise on one's own because every individual is different and one can just take it as, a, as advice and then see what applies to the self um Agum, would you would you agree with that have you faced uh, similar situations uh, during your journey as a campaign manager uh, what are the challenges that you faced and how do you suggest overcoming those say any top one or two challenges that you would like to address yeah the first, yeah the challenge is we face is uh, how to change people's perspective yeah mm. because yeah, when they uh, the perspective is changing, they could be changed or uh, take behavior to animals. And uh, this is really hard for in Indonesia because people uh, more react when to see the trigger uh, image and, and the good uh, image about the animal. So when they see the animal abuse things, yeah, they will trigger it and they react for the uh, maybe support for the uh, issues, but mm. I think that's if we more image like that, it's not really good for the campaign because we don't want to see all the time about this situation. We want to see the good things for the uh, uh, the peoples for uh, to get the awareness about the uh, being harmony with the wild. You know, so mm. yeah. Uh, the problem is like yeah, how to change the people's behavior is really, yeah, that's really really uh, challenging. Right? Yeah, I think that's a very important point that you raised, Agung. That behavioral change is very important, but very challenging also. And um, when I come back to photojournalism, Amy and Paul, uh, photos, rather visuals, are a very powerful medium, and. Uh, can you recall any instance, for example, that photojournalism has impacted a decision or has resulted in um, a behavioral change? Anything that comes to your mind offhand? I'm sure there must have been many instances where a photo or a visual has really brought about change. Yeah, I think with these issues, it's very much also 
like a slow evolving process you know it's about changing mindsets and about changing people's perceptions of animals as you said so for us we tend to enjoy focusing on the the, the, the messages that we get that are like okay this I saw this photo how can I help I saw this photo I'm mm. no longer going to consume animal products and you know to see those over like we, we all say like with the work that we do we want to try and change people's minds one individual at a time you know and I know we want to change sort of in a mass group but you know if one person can look at a photo and say right I'm never going to go to a zoo again or I want to dedicate time and sort of resources to ending this captivity trade with monkeys for example mm. so, yeah I would say that's really powerful for us yeah completely I think yes Paul you were saying something please go ahead All right, uh, we'll come to you then in a bit, uh, Paul. Uh, Agung, uh, am I audible to you? Yes. Okay. So Agung, um, you had touched upon YouTube as a case uh, study uh, that you had presented in your uh, presentation. And uh, social media is a very powerful tool. We all know that in today's time and age. Um, are there any campaigns that uh, you would like to talk about in addition to the one that you presented that had an impact on society at large and resulted in some sort of uh, behavioral change? Like Amy just mentioned, you know, even if you're going step by step and they're kind of bringing about a change, even in one individual, it is a domino effect. It does help in starting a kind of movement of sorts. And uh, uh, is this something that also you experienced in, in your time, in your profession, as a, specifically right now as a campaign manager for IAR? Yeah. Actually, uh, we start the campaign for the slow load uh, in the Instagram. So maybe 2016 there's a lot of uh, photo with uh, slow lorries as a pet so start uh, with the platforms named kukaku and then we try to uh, uh, take yeah just getting informed like how to uh, make them under understand uh, so, uh, to make them understand that's the not the proper proper pictures uh, mm -hmm. to show in the social media like that so mm -hmm. and then for this, uh, yeah, I think we have a success for the Slow Loris campaign uh, for time, like 2018, I think. So we move on to the other issues and then and we found like this, the issue like for cake is really new because it's starting like maybe last year or something, something happening here. So we have to uh, move uh, move right now to, to uh, tackling these uh, issues before it getting bigger and getting worse. So. Mm. So what we do, like, uh, what have we do, like, for the slowest campaign before is, like, I think we can do, th do this for the uh, macaques, yeah, the macaques too. Mm. But, but the problem here is, like, yeah, YouTube. YouTube still the problem because they give people to monetize. So we have mm. to, uh, how to reach, uh, approach the YouTube to make uh, uh, monetizing this not for uh, animal abuse videos. That's, mm. that's the the points for uh, YouTube, I think. Okay. So, uh, uh, yeah, I think that we have the, the experience with the campaign platform Kukanku. So I think we can move on to uh, other animals for, uh, is, yeah, monkeys, I think. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Last question to all of you is that um, we have also uh, apparently a lot of youth today uh, in our target audience, uh, in our audience who's listening to us and uh, uh, by, when I say youth, there will also be um, children who aspire to be um, to get into the field of animal advocacy, to be photojournalists uh, for this uh, field of animal welfare, animal rights. Uh, what is your advice uh, to the youngsters of uh, today? What do they keep in mind before opting for this field? We go, we go first. Um, that's a really good question. I think just hold on to that passion that they have for animals, let that guide them. And I think we also have a responsibility as animal advocates 
in Generation Forward to really encourage youngsters to get involved in these issues and see them as issues that really need to be addressed and need to be fought for. And as well, I think social media is really interesting because obviously the younger generation are all massively on social media at the moment. So for us, we can also make a difference with that by getting animal stories onto social media. So the positive stories and the negative stories. One thing that we have found has worked really well in reaching people is working with um, social media platforms. You know, they've got the big reach and we say, hey, we've got this footage, we want to talk about this issue, will you post this? And then we were able to reach the younger generation with these messages, mm -hmm. hopefully encouraging them to make the changes themselves. Wonderful. Thank you so much, uh, Amy, Paul, and Agong for your time and for those fantastic inputs. Uh, uh, wonderful presentations, lots of food for thought. And uh, it was a pleasure to have you with us on this platform once again. Thank you so, so much for being a part of Asia for Animals Conference and for those fantastic presentations and inputs. Stay with us, please, if possible, for the other sessions. And uh, once again, all the very best. Stay safe. Thank you. We now go into a short break and we'll be back at uh, 15.40 Indian Standard Time. That's 1540 Indian Standard Time. Till then, see you and don't forget to visit our exhibitors. All the best.